People ask how my run for the presidency can help the cryptocurrency community. I'll give you two examples here. I'll be including as much of the cryptocurrency world as I can into the political process. For example, some of the first two things I will use is clear poll. Why? It allows anyone with a smartphone to vote on any issue and have that vote connected to the blockchain verified by all. It allows for freedom of expression, free from the manipulation of the media and political parties. This is a tremendous boon. Second, docademic. Why? Look at the massive amounts of money, time, and effort that was put into Obamacare, and then the same amount of effort put into unwinding it. And yet with the blockchain, with Docademic, we have free medical care for everybody. Please, see how the run for president itself, not being president, but the run for it, the media platform, the stage, can help us all. And I'll be adding as many crypto coins, as many facilities. So you've recently announced that you're running for president. Can yes. you tell me a little bit about what your platform will be? Well. Uh, our, our slogan is uh, privacy, um, freedom, and technology. And uh, you know, we believe that uh, we've lost privacy here in America. Uh, from a technological standpoint, I think that's where America uh, has its greatest risks. Uh, we, we are in a cyber war with China now, whether we want to admit it or not. They have made off with over 14 million records of um, United States government employees, including people with top, top secret security clearances. That is are embedded agents in foreign governments. I mean, no greater coup in, in any war has ever been achieved than what the Chinese just achieved. And, and our government is just sort of you know, shrugging it off. Oh, well. And uh, John, you just created a new political party, the Cyber Party. Tell yes. me a little bit about that. Well, again, we believe that the, our government is, is technologically illiterate. Uh, and people are running for president who claim not to have ever sent an email that think that wiping a disk means getting a damp cloth and, and wiping your computer. Um, and we're living in a cyber age where the next war is not going to be waged with bombs and bullets, it's going to be a cyber war. Where we wake up one morning and our electricity is gone because they've shut down all of the electricity uh, switching uh, devices. Uh, airplanes are going to be falling out of the sky because they've hacked into their control systems and put them all in a stall. Uh, our automobiles are going to be running off the, off the freeways. It's going to be chaos. All of our money will, will disappear and all of our, our records will be jumbled. But John, no candidate has ever won representing a third party. Why do you think you can with cyber? Well, I mean, statistically, then I'm, I, I, it's a perfect chance for me. It's like someone said, well, no, there hasn't been an American president with a, with a beard for 100 years ago. God, that's great. It's kind of like, okay, so you're playing roulette and black has come up 25 times in a row. Well, red will have to come up eventually. So who cares? It, it doesn't matter whether the, the no third party candidate has won before. Do you want a two party system to go in, per, in perpetuity in this country? Look at the mess that is created. They're machines. Uh, they have created the politics which created the mess in this country. So it has to stop. Why can't it stop this year? So, John, even if you were able to overcome the challenges that face a third party candidate, there's a lot of concern that you're not a serious candidate. Why are you a more serious candidate than, say, Donald Trump? Yeah, I, I don't know where the non-seriousness comes from because um, I have never done anything, anything, whether it's start a business or, or what have you, without knowing I was going to succeed. Uh, and for a year and a half, my, my advisors, my friends, my, my fans have been urging me to run for president. I only agreed when I realized, okay, I know how to win. Uh, and I will win this. I, I, I'm 70 years old. I can't waste a year of my life campaigning for nothing. So seriousness, absolutely. As to my life, they think, you know, my life is not serious. I don't know anybody with a more serious life. Um, I mean, I, I don't know any other candidate who has hid in the jungles of Central America while, while an entire army was, was searching for them. Uh, I don't know anybody who spent uh, weeks in a Guatemalan jail sleeping on a concrete floor. I mean, I don't know, it sounds serious to me. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about that, John. What can you tell us about what happened in Belize? Well, what happened in Belize is I, I was just foolish. I, have, I, have, I thought I had retired there. I've invested a, a, a huge amount of money. Uh, when the government uh, came to me and asked for a $2 million donation, I politely declined it. Um, a week later, 
42 armed soldiers stormed my property, shot my dog in front of my eyes, uh, you know, more or less tortured me, destroyed a half million dollars worth of my property, and then left. The following morning, that same political person came and said, oh my God, what a terrible mistake, we're so sorry. It was a huge mistake. You know, they, they were looking for someone else, and I don't know where they got the information, I'm so sorry, have you reconsidered your donation? And I said, get the F off of my property. Uh, that began a war with Belize, which, uh, which uh, ended up with me uh, on the run. So I should have been a smart person and written them a check for $2 million and said thank you. I just didn't do that. But because you went on the run, there's some questions you know, among American voters about whether or not they can trust you with such a record. I mean, what do you say to those voters? Okay, the, the, the Belize government never charged me with anything. They wanted to question me. You have to understand that in third world countries, especially Central America, Banana Republic, that involves uh, terrible questioning, like swinging you up by your heels, putting a football helmet on your head and beating it until your brains turn to mush. That's not the type of questioning I wish to undergo. Now, maybe you would, maybe other Americans said, well, you should have gone ahead and, and, and endured that. I don't think so. I chose not to do it. And I've offered, to, I've offered to meet them on any neutral country, including here in America, to answer any question that they have. They have declined. They don't want to ask questions. They want to punish me for embarrassing the government. So, so that was that. But, but that's, that's really not what I'm here to talk about. I, I, don't, I think the American public is smart enough to understand that, that things happen to people. You know, if you go out and you're outside the box and you, you explore and you're trying to find out what life is all about, you're going to step in holes and you're going to find bees' nests. What about more recently with the DUI that occurred in August? Uh, again, it was a DUI. I had, I had just uh, uh, obtained a subscription, a subscription uh, um, uh, for uh, Xanax, a prescription. Uh, I had just gotten it that day. I've got all the doctor's proofs and things. Uh, I don't do well on Xanax, okay? I'd taken it two hours before I was stopped, and it, it was, again, I was impaired, I admit that. Uh, in Tennessee, however, if, if it's a legal prescription, uh, if there's no uh, warning on the label saying don't drive, I had had no alcohol in my blood, um, you know, it will, it will simply be dismissed. It was bad judgment, but then who has not had bad judgment? Um, so, again, these are things that, you know, we, we live in a country where if, if we're looking for a squeaky clean candidate, someone who's never done anything or been anywhere, uh, who's, who's never experienced some, some troubles, then that, that's fine. I'm not sure that that's what we want because that's what we've been electing for, for 100 years. So, John, you talked about, you know, a couple instances, particularly the DUI. You just said you had bad judgment in that case. How you would you um, show voters that you would have good judgment as president? Well, I mean, like in, in 70 years to have a couple of bad judgments is not that bad, I think. Uh, you know, I mean, you might end up having bad judgment by inviting me on here. You don't know. We never know until the, until the end product. Um, but, of course, I mean, who, who does not uh, have bad judgment from time to time? My good judgment is, is very apparent, you know, when I chose to create uh, McAfee, the antivirus company. We were the first business in, in securing computers from viruses. Uh, that judgment worked out pretty well. The company's valued at $8 billion, was acquired by Intel. Uh, every company that I has fo have formed has been a success. Again, I don't do things to fail, I do things to succeed. That requires really good judgment. And so, John, I wanted to ask you a little bit about your electronic campaign. Yes. Uh, so I know you've been walking around Startup Alley today. What kind of companies have you met and which well, have stuck out, out to you? I, I'd like to talk about a couple of them. One is called... Uh, Fire Talk, which, um, which we're, we just cut a deal, we, we're, we're going into partnership where I'm going to be using Fire Talk uh, for my fireside chats because once a week I'll be going on, uh, on the air on the internet with the American public and I'll be talking. I'm going to throw out crazy ideas. I mean, and maybe they're not so crazy, like um, what if we disbanded the TSA? That might be the first thing I'll throw out there. And then people write back and go, well, that's crazy because who's going to secure us and so on. And we'll talk it through. We can do that because we have software that will parse all of the incoming communication. Parsing means taking it apart and finding out what are they really saying here. And you might find out that 10,000 people have asked the same question but in different ways. Well then our software will go, ah, this is what they're really asking. And I will answer that question. And then they'll throw out another and I'll answer these questions. So we will work through jointly, the entire American public and me, our platform and how we will solve these issues. So, Nobody can do that. I mean, no one has done that. Uh, I have the technical competence to slap that together in very short order. It's not that complex for me. I can do it in my sleep. The other candidates do not have that capacity. Well, thank uh, you I so made that statement to, to um, bring to the attention that the FBI does not really want to crack one phone. 
Um, the FBI wants the master code to all Apple iPhones. Uh, and if it gets that, the next thing they'll be doing is knocking on Google's store, and Google has 95% of the world market for smartphones. And we will all be spied on, not just by the FBI, but by our enemies, by hackers, because once you put a backdoor into a, a system, it cannot be contained. We've learned that over and over and over again. The entire world, the Chinese, the Russians, and every black hat hacker on the planet will have it, and our bank accounts will be vacated, we will lose our credit cards, our identities, it will be chaos, sir. So you, you, you think Apple's right? Apple is absolutely right. We, we live in an age, Larry, where, where our government is completely illiterate in cybersecurity. We're a good 20 years behind the Chinese and the Russians, and the next war is not going to be fought with nuclear weapons. It will, it, it will be a cyber war of so vast devastation that it will be unimaginable. You said that you could unlock the San Bernardino terrorist phones for the FBI without upsetting the rest of it. How would you do that? Well, there are certain people in the world, Larry, and I'm not saying that I'm among them, but I certainly know many who are, who have very unique talents. There are mathematicians who can multiply two 100-digit numbers in their heads and instantly give you the answer. We have Bach and Mozart. Uh, who cannot be trained. These are people with innate superhuman talents. Hackers also have these talents. Uh, I, I know many of them. Uh, I promise you that, in fact, I've, I've, I've said, if, if we can't do it within three weeks, I will eat my shoe on the Neil Cavuto show. <laughs> are, are privacy and security mutually exclusive? No, absolutely not, sir. Um, first of all, what is privacy? We, do, we don't understand that that hundreds of times per day we exercise that right to privacy. When you buy something from the grocery store, you don't tell your most intimate details to the checkout clerk. You talk about the weather or the price of eggs. Um, with some of your close friends, you may reveal more. With your spouse, you may tell your spouse everything, uh, unless you're having an affair, and you might choose not to tell even your spouse that. So we exercise privacy hundreds of times per day. And without that right, our society would absolutely cave in. Can you imagine what would happen if everyone knew everything about everybody else? We're very judgmental people. We are imperfect creatures. We, we have to have privacy in order to keep the glue of society together. Trump called for a war against Apple. What'd you think of that? Well, Trump has called for war against everything. I mean, Trump <laughs> wants to build a wall between our nation and the nation of the finest tunnel builders on the planet. Think about this. I mean, <laughs> El Chapo escaped from prison in a mile-long tunnel on a motorcycle on rails that had uh, water pumps and ventilation in it. Uh, the Mexicans can tunnel through anything. I don't care what you want to do from a wall. It's an absurd thing to do. So he has called for war against everything. But the war against Apple is the most absurd. Because really, it shows that he does not understand to any degree what cybersecurity is and what the effects of putting backdoors into software can be. Why do you want to run for president? Because sir, the greatest problem facing America today is cyber war. It is on the horizon, Larry. Already, two teenagers took out the entire country of Ukraine's power for one day using a 25-year-old piece of software with 17 lines of code. Can you imagine, sir, what the Chinese can do to us? They have the capability now to completely disrupt our electrical power supply permanently. And what does that mean? No communications, uh, no food delivery, uh, no production of, of all of our necessities. A, a report to Congress last year said that 90% of the American population would perish in a cyber war with China. And you tell me who is running today who can fix this problem. All right, you mentioned smart people. There are smart people everywhere, and there are the Mozarts in the box. Aren't there also smart people on our side that can stop this? Right, but they're, they're not within the government, Larry. Because these smart people, the, the, the truly talented hackers, the truly talented cybersecurity specialists, they have 14-inch purple mohawks and pierced ears and tattooed faces, and they demand to smoke weed while they're working. Well, who is going to hire them within the government? Yes, we have them, and fortunately, they are on our side. We are not utilizing them, and we have to if we are to survive as a nation. This is an absolute necessity. 
we have to learn that we cannot judge by appearance. We cannot judge because someone thinks differently or acts differently from us. We recently had the last libertarian presidential candidate, Gary Jans Johnson, on the show. Would he be your chief rival to get the nomination this year? Well, I, you know, I, I just debated Gary Johnson two days ago. He's a very nice gentleman, uh, a, a very nice gentleman. Uh, twice he's run and gotten less than 1% of the vote. We have to have someone who can win, Larry. We really do. Um, you know, I'm seven years old. I am not doing this in order to make a statement or to change somebody's opinion. I don't have that luxury. Uh, I'm not wasting a year of my life making a statement. I'm doing this to win. And, and one of the things I've learned, Larry, is that the human spirit is indomitable and infinite in its capacities, if you know yourself. And if you have the talents and put those talents to, to the direct use, uh, I intend to win this. I really do. And you may say, well, that's absurd. Well, you want to know what's absurd? Watch the Republican debates. They're <laughs> making fun of each other, putting on makeup, for heaven's sake. <laughs> we have a country filled with problems that deserve a compassionate look and an intelligent analysis, and I do not see this. Everybody agrees with half of liberals like half of libertarianism, conservatives like half of libertarianism. What is libertarianism? Can you, can you nutshell it for me? Yes, sir. Uh, libertarianism is a very simple philosophy that's based upon personal freedom and personal privacy. Uh, the basic tenets are keep your contracts well, or, or keep your agreements. There is no other way to live. I found that out. Uh, that personal freedom and personal fri privacy are paramount. And I found that out, but I've been incarcerated a number of times. I am a civil disobedience person, uh, and I fully believe that we own our own bodies, and we may do with them as we choose. And because I have acted that way, I've been incarcerated many times. Well, there was one exception when I was incarcerated for stupidity. But other than that, <laughs> it's civil disobedience because I believe we get to do with our bodies as we choose. The, the libertarians believe that our government is too overburdened and, and inefficient. Uh, it believes that, that we have problems here at home that must be addressed. Uh, there are very simple principles which really all Americans believe in, Larry. It, All Americans. It doesn't we favor. cannot harm another person, and we cannot harm another person, nor can we take the things that they own. We all believe this. this is, yeah. These are the fundamental tenets of libertarianism. It doesn't favor vast armies abroad, right? I'm sorry? It doesn't favor vast military elsewhere. No, it, it doesn't. Larry, we, we're, we have problems here at home. We really do. So how um, would libertarians... And our military how would libertarians approach ISIS? Well, who created ISIS, Larry? Isn't this the fundamental question? I mean, we keep bombing people. If, if you were living in the Middle East and a bomb destroyed your neighbors next door and your friends and killed your brother and your father and possibly your mother, and you could do nothing, you were, you were completely helpless against these invisible things that were being controlled by people halfway around the world, you would be angry, you would be frustrated, you would want to strike out. And so they do. Well, we just strike back at them. We created terrorism, Larry, by interfering in the affairs of nations that we had absolutely no business interfering in. And we did it for purely economic reasons. We have to take at least a small part of that responsibility. We do, sir. And, and the, the, the problem with ISIS shows a complete failure in our national defense. It does, because we are putting so much money into military hardware and nothing into cyber security and cyber awareness, which could have told us easily what was happening before it actually happened. So this is the problem, Larry. We have to fix it by, by, by coming home and fixing ourselves.